Okay, so hello everyone, dear participants and all of you who are watching us. Good evening, I am Somoga Basu and I'm the president and founder of the Council for Global Cooperation. And I warmly welcome you all to our today's session. The CGC is an independent non-partisan forum aimed at tackling global issues through independent research, analysis, and open dialogue. The major research elements that we uh, have undertaken are uh, uh, genocide and disaster studies, international history and foreign policy, Cold War and Third World studies. Our today's event is a CGC lecture titled Ukraine's New Art, Addressing War and Decolonization, presented by Dr. Svetlana Biedarieva. Let me start by uh, briefly introducing her. Svetlana is an award-winning art historian, artist, and curator. Her research focuses on contemporary Ukrainian art, the coloniality, and Russia's ongoing war against Ukraine. She received her PhD in history of art from the Courtauld Institute of Art at the University of London. She is the editor of the book, Contemporary Ukrainian and Baltic Art, Political and Social Perspectives, 1991 to 2021, and co-editor of At the Frontline, Ukrainian Art, 2013 to 2019. In 2022 to 23, Svetlana was selected as the George F. Kennan Fellow at the Kennan Institute Wilson Center and the non-resident visiting fellow at the George Washington University for her research. The, uh, uh, the CEC Arts Link International Fellow for her curatorial work and the Prince Claus Seed Award Laureate for her artistic work. She has published her texts in numerous academic journals and media outlets. And in addition to being an art historian and scholar, Svetlana, as I mentioned, is a prolific artist herself. Um, her uh, her uh, important art projects include the morphology of war, the night has come, and decolonization. Today's session is going to be a unique one as uh, Svetlana self demonstrated to a several uh, wartime art along with her own portfolio. We regret that a session like this uh, couldn't be made possible in a physical mode, but uh, we are grateful to Svetlana that in this session, we are going to experience a new theme and shall witness some of her uh, interesting and stimulating research. So without further delays, over to you, Sutran. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Samava, for, for inviting me. It's a pleasure to talk today. And uh, I think it's very important uh, that uh, there's a context in which I'm talking about Ukrainian art because uh, it has been, it has been uh, quite few um, uh, interaction between uh, Ukraine and India, I think, in, in terms of culture. And uh, uh, I think, uh, I hope that uh, this, my talk will contribute to establishing uh, stronger connections in terms of uh, artistic exchange and culture and kind of expanding knowledge about Ukrainian contemporary art. Uh, so uh, I will present uh, a talk uh, that I developed uh, when during my stay at, uh, at, uh, at the Canon Institute uh, at Winfield Center. And, uh, uh, first, I will talk about uh, decolonial perspectives uh, in Ukrainian art practices after 2014. And uh, then I have another PowerPoint to show uh, my own work and then we talk already in the context of, of, of my work. So um, I will start uh, the presentation. Okay. In this lecture, I will focus on uh, the transformations that Ukrainian art has experienced since the outbreak of the war of Russia against Ukraine. I will discuss the stages of development of wartime art in Ukraine between 2014 and 2022, and explore the main topics which Ukrainian artists address as they challenge and dismantle longstanding uh, Russian colonial narratives. I aim to examine how artists' work reinterprets and disputes Ukraine's belonging to post-Soviet space and address the ongoing trauma of exposure to military violence through a decolonial perspective. 
I will also discuss the place of politically and socially engaged practices of resistance uh, following the outbreak of violence brought about by the full-scale invasion in February uh, 2022. In my every talk, I remark that uh, the notions of the post-colonial and the decolonial, which are central to, 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 to my research, uh, are not interchangeable. Uh, particularly in the context of uh, relationship between uh, Ukraine and Russia. Rather, they reflect two different stages of liberation from colonial entanglement. While well, the notion of post-colonial denotes the situation immediately following the colonial experience and reinterprets the implications of colonialism, the notion of decolonial uh, takes one step further because it speaks about the final process of dismantling of uh, colonial narratives. The colonial researcher Madina Tlastanova remarks on the chronological and logical discrepancies between the two approaches. She says, the postcolonial condition is more of an objective given, a geopolitical and geohistorical situation of many people coming from former colonies. The decolonial stance is one step further, as it involves a conscious choice of how to interpret reality and how to act upon it. Uh, so, uh, it, 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 of course, this is related to two uh, different uh, uh, visions proposed by the postcolonial theory and the, the decolonial theory. Uh, in, in context of Ukraine, the atrocities of the anachronistic Russian war of aggression have brought Ukraine to the culmination of its decolonial stage. With the once dominating postcolonial narrative of Russian culture as enveloping Ukrainian culture uh, have, have, has collapsed irreversibly. Indeed, any further aggressive action from uh, Russia towards Ukraine will only continue to foster what is an inevitable decolonial shift. Dlostanova, together with the decolonial theorist uh, Walter Mignolo, proposed that a decolonial perspective is first of all an epistemological project, which is dedicated to production of new disentangled knowledge versus the postcolonial recombination of existing narratives as an inquiry into memory and history. And this uh, epistemological dimension is central to, uh, to, when we look at Ukrainian art, because Ukrainian art produces images, narratives, uh, stories, uh, which contribute to this uh, process of uh, knowledge production. In my research, I often undertake a decolonial theoretical framework, but I accept the necessity of developing a new methodology that would account for the particular situation of the shared border between Ukraine and Russia, which forms the colonial and post-colonial relation between the two countries. Speaking about Ukrainian art, I find it useful to apply the concept of horizontal art history, proposed by a Polish art historian, Piotr Petrovsky, as a nonlinear, diffuse, and polyphonic model, which calls to consider every local art scene individually in its own social and political context, and challenges hierarchical vertical art history, which divides the field into centers and peripheries of art production. For example, Ukrainian art history is crafted from notion and visual, notions and visual, visualities belonging to different ideologies, one suppressed cultural elements and distorted identities, is each proper for its location. Also, Petrovsky himself didn't view his uh, theory as decolonial, addressing his approach, uh, we will, uh, it's possible to explore how the recent find contemporary art history in the region and reimagine the space of art production. And uh, uh, now, now I will discuss uh, several uh, case studies of uh, Ukrainian of Ukrainian art art artists uh, with the works of Ukrainian artists, uh, starting with uh, the Ukrainian artist Alevtina Kahidza. Uh, she is uh, uh, a performer, a graphic artist, uh, and uh, in her work she reflects on important political and social topics uh, related to the war of Russia against Ukraine. Uh, born in the Donetsk region. Kahidze experienced all the implications of the ruining effect of the war in the territories occupied by Russia in 2014. And this, this is reflected in, in her art. Kahidze's project Invasions, recently shown at Manifesta Biennial in Kosovo, includes a collaboration with documentary filmmaker Pyotr Arminovsky, which is a 360 degrees degree film, Invasions 1 to 3. In this film, the action begins next to the graveyard uh, monument of Kahidze's mother, Lyudmila Andreevna. And this is the image to the, to the left, uh, which is constructed uh, by her daughter in a shape that represents the, the artist's childhood house. Her mother, a retired uh, teacher, nicknamed by her pupils uh, Klubnika, or Strawberry Andreevna, 
Lifting the town of Zdanivka, located in the Donetsk region, uh, which was occupied by pro-Russian forces, the so-called uh, recognized Donetsk People's Republic, in 2014. From the very beginning of the war with Russia until a her untimely death at the military outpost, when uh, the woman was crossing uh, the border between occupied territory and Ukrainian land in 2019, uh, the, mother, uh, the mother of uh, Kahidza couldn't see her daughter in person. The artist took notes on their communication over the phone and later incorporated them into a series of drawings and handwritten notes under the general title Through the War with Strawberry Andreeva that represented her mother's anxious, but at the same time, a sincere interpretation of military violence surrounding her home. Uh, the new film by Kahidze and Arminovsky developed the topic by looking at the aftermath of the full-scale invasion in the Kiev region, resulting in death and destruction. The film uh, is the particular quality of this film that it permits changing the angles of view and allows a variety of perspectives which fo focus either on the ruins of the shelled buildings in, in Kiev region, interviews with them, or on peaceful parts of the surroundings which envelop the disaster of Zelensky. The point of view in this film is important for taking a certain personal position in regard to the atrocity and the effects of invasion. Uh, the, the viewer can select whether he sees the ruin or he sees uh, the, peaceful, the peaceful part of the landscape. It would seem that the post-colonial paradigm unfolded in, in this film in full, as it proposes the ambivalent vision of the surrounding reality and the ruining effects of the war. The possibility of either immersion into the situation of avoiding traumatic narratives by looking away from it is central to the post-colonial ambivalence. That is, uh, uh, that, that is interpreted by critical theorist Homi Baba, occurs when the oppressor and the oppress, oppressed regard one another within an ambiguous perspective. In the context of hybridity, when the dominant culture infects its colonial domain with its own identity. Therefore, any event can, de, can be interpreted as a genus face. This choice of perspectives is, however, illusory in the work of Kahidze and, uh, and Arminovsky, as any attempt to look away from atrocity would only remark uh, on its presence in the scene. The postcolonial hybridity and ambivalence are dismantled as a result of this unable ability to see the destruction brought about by Russia's neocolonial attempts. And the witnesses of violence return to a single perspective, which constitutes real time anti colonial resistance. The work uh, by, by Kahidze and Arminovsky enters into uh, dialogue. Uh, here is the, precisely the drawings that the, uh, the artist did uh, after her communication with her mother over the phone between 2014 and 2019 before her mother died. Uh, okay. This work by, uh, by Kahidze and Arminovsky enters into dialogue with earlier works of the hybrid stage preceding the full-scale invasion. Those are directly addressed post-colonial ambivalence and the resulting invisibility of the Russian war. One such project which reflects on partial visions of war violence is a serious blind spot uh, from 2014 by Makola Ridney. In this series of photographs of a building uh, or several buildings rather in Eastern Ukraine, uh, heavily damaged by Russian shelling, a circular, circular blind spot, in fact, which is a black ink blot, obscures a significant part of every image. In some works, the extent of the destruction is covered in ink and thus no longer visible permitting only the surrounding landscape to be seen. While in others, the rubble is visible through seemingly, though seemingly removed from its surrounding context. Uh, in a version of the project realized together with the, the Ukrainian poet Sergei Jadan on a large banner partially covering a building in Berlin, the image to the, to, to, the, to the left, a small circular view of rubble from a destroyed building in Lugansk appears to float in a field of black. Ridne visually addresses the gradual loss of visibility of violence and voluntary societal blindness to traumatic war events proper for uh, the year 2014. Jadan in his turn uses words to address the theme of destruction, recalling the bombing of a museum in Donetsk in his text, The Executed Museum, and pointing out that the devastation of buildings and cultural heritage really stays in the museum, uh, sorry, really stays in public memory of those who didn't inhabit the place in which it occurred only remaining in the memory of those who survived the aggression. This work can be also read in a more general way as a metaphor for the invisibility of evil as a post-colonial condition. 
or more specifically for the fact that the peripheral territories in Eastern Ukraine were not considered of ultimate importance when the war broke out there in 2014. In 2022, however, it has become clear that the avoidance of the topic of the war in the East didn't resolve the problem, but rather made it deeper. Indeed, the crimes hiding behind blind spots are now in plain sight. The, uh, the decontextualization of war effects in the works by Ridney represents what the colonial scholar Boventura de Souza Santos calls absent subjects. Where the subjects of knowledge production are deemed incapable of being such due to their nature, which is interpreted either as lack of experience, lack of authority, or simply being unintelligible for dominant knowledge structures. This can be related to the postcolonial condition as a weaker peripheral position in what the colonial theory calls as a colonial matrix of power, which is a rigid hierarchical structure which reproduces coloniality even after the era of global colonialism has come to an end. With the spread of the war effects on the entire territory of Ukraine, this approach of discursive omission of the occupied territories, which was criticized by Ridney and Jadan, is radically changing today. This includes a transition from a post-colonial slow step-by-step -step cultural transformation to a rapid decolonial cultural shift, which we can count starting from 2022. It is noteworthy, however, that the same understanding of absent subjects was until recently applied to entire Ukraine as a less experienced new state formed presumably after 1991 and deprived of its knowledge before this date because this knowledge was largely disputed and appropriated by Russia. Dana Kavilana's uh, 2019 series, Communications, Exit to the Blind Spot, takes on another aspect of invisibility imposed by new colonial oppression. In her drawing, woman kills the son of the enemy, woman recreates the logic of war, uh, she takes, uh, she, she discusses uh, the effect of rape as a consequence of war. An attempt of killing a child conceived by an enemy kills her, uh, the woman's own child, connected to her by an umbral cord, which becomes a murder tool. The artist reflects on how violence, not only physical, but also epistemic, uh, and the extreme transgression of intimate space procreate. In this work, Kavelina points out that the immersion into war and the hate produced by it often becomes a self-destructive mechanism. And at the same time, she points out the particular vulnerability of civilian women in the conditions of war. The project that was made in 2019 in the context of the reported atrocities in the east of Ukraine after 2014, uh, that were almost full, uh, the, sorry, the project was made in 2019 in the context of the reported atrocities in the east of Ukraine uh, after 2014. And these atrocities were almost fully omitted by media and society's attention. The distance from the war and the Ukrainian society's indifference to its presence in the east of the country at that time and the silence of victims of violence are also addressed in uh, Kavelina's drawing from the threats of silence, a pullover for a soldier is soon from the same series. The red sweater for the Russian soldier as a symbol of violence and atrocity he brings with him is crafted from silence of those who are afraid to speak about his crime, which negates the right to, to corporeality to its victims. The decolonial turn that dismantled the postcolonial ambivalence in Ukraine with the widespread effect on the entire post-Soviet space showed that there are no blind spots, as both ruination and peaceful life are visible uh, as in the aforementioned uh, film in Kahidze and Arminovsky. Uh, and at the same time, the traumatic discrepancy between the past and the present is being erased. The full-scale invasion, however, brought about a different type of unintelligibility the uncomprehensive nature of the atrocities that unfold on the territory of Ukraine for all over 2022. As Ukrainian society and the world fail to realize the full extent of violence against Ukrainian civilians and military alike that affected the zones invaded by the Russian army in 2022. And uh, I return again to Alevtina Kahidze, her drawing Bucha Me 47 minutes by car, uh, depicts the impossibility of visually recording the extreme violence that occurred in Bucha, a town near Kiev that was heavily affected by the Russian occupation, with more than 300 civilians killed by the Russian army and buried in mass graves. The artist's body is bent in sorrow, shown in front of a vast red blood, which marks the massacre of civilians and numerous rapes that Russian soldiers performed there. This work directly addresses the unrepresentability of violence an important notion that entered the European scholarly and philosophical discourses in the aftermath of the, the Second World War and the atrocities of the Holocaust. Uh, Kahidze's work echoes the German philosopher Tardon Adorno's famous statement 
that to write a poem after Auschwitz is barbaric, as a very artistic representation of death became an excessive, as, as excessive as unnecessary after the horror of the unspeakable. Similarly, the Ukrainian immediate experience of the war brought about the idea that any attempts to represent this violence are inevitably reductive, and that the only way to truly confront its horror is to acknowledge its unrepresentability. From a decolonial point of view, this uh, unrepresentability presents a problem of forming an epistemological basis, as the creation of new knowledge is obstructed by the impossibility of visualization of, of the events, and consequently, comprehension of the magnitude of them. Therefore, the violence and suffering can be all, often silenced or ignored by still dominant post-colonial narratives. The task of Kahidze in this work is to return representability to them through addressing them and by representing her own life experience of proximity to the massacre. Not showing the traumatic event itself, but uh, rather an uh, artist's reaction to it, condensed to a seemingly naive reflection. Such a decolonial gesture challenges what Jacques Rancière calls a modernist vision of unrepresentability, which according to the philosopher deprives victims of their image, turning instead to the depiction of the atrocity as a rhetoric figure, actualized by communication between the artist and the event as a relative connection between them. As a decolonial turn, the conditions of external aggression brings new uh, visibilities and at the same time overshadows selected elements in the social and cultural spheres. The situation requires a new approach to memory. The necessity of the production of new narratives in a time of war implies an extended process of documentation as an initial process of the creation of new production of knowledge free of colonial influences. In contrast to the 2014-2022 stage of the war when Ukrainian art largely turned to the interpretations of contested history as part of the post-colonial recombination process, the situation after 2022, after the full-scale invasion, uh, began is characterized by the active focus on the production of works that narrate immediate experience of the artists as witnesses of the atrocities and aim to record a completely new stage in Ukrainian history without extended references to the past. The increased production of narratives as a collective movement helps challenge the center periphery model, marked the, the final dismantling of uh, uh, post Soviet space with uh, Russian aggressive actions and apart from. Uh, the, uh, sorry, the increased production of narratives as a collective movement helped challenge the center periphery model, marked the final dismantling of post-Soviet space with Russian uh, aggressive actions, and apart from an international, uh, from internal transformation, constituted a profound external change for Ukraine, for which the decolonial disentanglement manifests its exit from the blind spot in international visibility. The emerging decoloniality in Ukrainian art after 2022 permits a variety of perspectives, but post-colonial ambivalence and hybridity are erased as a result of Russia's unequivocal extreme aggression on Ukraine's territory. The next artist I'm going to discuss is uh, Jana Kadyrova. Her serial the data extraction embarks on the idea of a place preserving the knowledge as evidence of the atrocity and uh, taking part in the formation of new historical memory. In her ready-made installation that data extraction Irpin from 2022, the artist focuses on the destiny of the city of Irpin in the Kiev region, where the Russian invasion in the spring of 2022 caused significant damages and numerous deaths among civilians. The war displays a cross-section of asphalt damaged by a missile from the, city, uh, from, from, from the, from the city's district Irpinsky Lipki that shows the extent of destruction that the city suffered during Russian atrocities in the town. Initiated in 2011, the serious data extraction consists of extracted pieces of concrete and asphalt, uh, and it has changed its conceptual focus and objectives over time. First, in 2011-2013, it aimed to map the streets of Kyiv to record the renovation of the streets and roads in the city for the Euro 2012 football championship that served at the time as criticism of uh, exclusively superficial changes in the city and uh, a sign of corruption in uh, city reconstruction. After 2014, the artist turned to the documentation of damage in various cities of Ukraine during, due to the Russian military actions, including materials from the occupied territory. And finally, after 2022, her work expanded due to the increased level of destruction which the artist came to document. The series represents a different kind of war documentation, where the physical proof of destruction is preserved in a ready-made. 
The use of stone and asphalt as durable materials re refer to the long-term effects of such destruction and its inscription into public memory. This project in its new version is also one of the uh, early attempts at memorialization, where the real life evidence of aggression is transported to a gallery, sp uh, gallery space and displayed to the public. Moving from the critique of reconstruction to the documentation of forecast damages, this project changed its orientation from internal, focusing on local, social, and political tensions, to external, focusing on the traumatic events of the ongoing war. Kadyrova's forensic work with direct evidence is an example of how the memory of the ongoing atrocity is formed. The unprocessed documentation as a ready-made comes in consequence of no time distance, which would help comprehend the traumatic experience of ruination and death. The new decolonial epistemology manifests here as a documentation without any mediation, as direct evidence of the crimes and its immediate inscription into public memory. The forensic approach through the construction of the events by the otherwise peripheral evidence, uh, which connotes the situation of the war, but doesn't fully speak of it, is the focus of the work Repeat After Me by Open Group. This is a video which features interviews with displaced people from Ukraine's eastern and southern regions who found their shelter in Lviv in 2022. The interviewees do not narrate their experience. Instead, they imitate a variety of sounds brought by the war. The noise produced by different types of military equipment, shelling by rockets, weapons, anti-aerial defense, and drones. Ironic at first glance, as it is repeated by the eyewitnesses, uh, this practical knowledge refers to the conditions of survival in the war circumstances. After more than a year of uh, full-scale invasion, Ukrainian society obtained experience in distinguishing between different sounds that indicate a different degree of danger. So this knowledge that they transmit is also a practical knowledge in, in the war conditions. This intrinsic knowledge helps to reconstruct the event going around, ongoing around without seeing their cause, just by listening to the sound. The video has an interactive component which invites the audience to repeat those sounds in this way, sharing the knowledge which is unlikely to obtain in peaceful circumstances, but which is crucial as life saving in the conditions of the war. The epistemological basis that is formed in this work shows how the shift in the forms of perception and expression occurs as the new knowledge is validated through life threatening circumstances. The decolonial process here is ongoing through the production of a new narrative, which is actualized only by the context of the situation and which looks uh, obviously redundant uh, outside it. The dialogue which uh, this works establishes uh, with the audience outside the war zone proposes to recontextualize this knowledge, to extend its foundations beyond the territory of the immediate war impact. Olya Mikhailuk's uh, new film, uh, also dedicated to Irpin, as uh, Jana Kadyrova's work, uh, which is called Irpin Chronicles of Revival, uh, features a similar epistemological inquiry through facing direct witnesses and survivors of violent events in the town of Rupin in the spring of uh, 2022. However, in this project, uh, Mikhailuk uh, turns to the direct speech of the eyewitnesses. The artist looks at the revival of the city following the destructions and numerous deaths through the lens of the connection between the people and the nature that surrounds them, making parallels between reconstruction and natural regeneration. The inhabitants of Irpin speak about their gardens, show the plants they take care of, and share their losses of relatives and friends that occurred because of the Russian aggression. For example, in the episode Pani Tanya, which is uh, the, 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 the image to, to, also to the left, uh, the interview begins her narration by sharing her memories of the forest that surrounded the town of Irpin in uh, the past, and further she talks about her garden of, from, from which she lives, which supports her living. At some moment in her monologue, Pani Tanya tells about her grandson Dima, who died from shelling and was buried in her garden for several weeks during the Russian occupation of the area. The story continues with Pani Tanya proudly giving a detailed tour of the same garden, showing vegetables and flowers growing there. The drama of the loss interviews with the hope of, of revival that her garden gave to her. Both nature and culture participate in this uh, process of Ukraine society resistance to the invasion and overcoming its aftermath, as we speak about the end of, of, of post-colonial situation and beginning of the decolonial reconstruction and recovery after the war, which in this case has this metaphor of uh, natural regeneration. The work of Adana Kavelina, 
Letter to a Turtle Dove, made in 2020, uh, presented a bridge between the distance documentary way of seeing the war events proper the, uh, for the post-2014 hybrid situation and personalized reflection on violence that became more apparent after uh, February 2022, of which, uh, for example, the, the film of Mikhailuk was exemplary. In the film of Kavilina, uh, the artist appropriated and reinterpreted the fun five-hour footage of post-2014 events in Donbass by an anonymous author titled To Watch the War. The artist incorporated violent and transgressive scenes taken in the occupied east of Ukraine, uh, which were present in this film, which is uh, freely available online. So she, she just kind of appropriated uh, that, that, that footage. Uh, uh, so uh, she uh, incorporated those violent and transgressive scenes uh, taken between 2014 and 2018 into her film and responded to them in the manner of the artist's poetic monologue, with inclusions of animated scenes, staged interventions, and archival footage from Soviet Donbass. In multiple layers, ranging from literary to amateur uh, documentary forms, the film explores the historical relationship between Russian colonialism in Ukraine and military aggression in the regions uh, occupied after 2014, as an attempt to look at the outbreak of violence uh, following 2014, where Donbass appears in the artist's own words, not a specific victim of the aggression, but the victim that has agency in encapsulating Russian violence on its territory. A capacity for such enveloping is defined by the region's entangled and complex past constituted by conflicting identities and uneven layers of political and social history. The nonlinear structure of the film shows this continuity as seen through the eyes of a victim of violence, as both an eyewitness of atrocities and a martyr, because it is precisely this position that uh, the artist emphasizes of a martyr which uh, reclaims agency through self-sacrifice. Uh, another uh, example uh, that I would like to discuss is uh, Katerina Lisovenko's work, uh, where she uh, focuses on the utopian dimension of the decolonial release in her, in her painting, uh, Propaganda of the World of My Dreams, The Last Day of the Last Totalitarianism. The large, scale, the, the large scale painting depicts a mystical space where the agency is restored and the borders that enclose Ukrainian society are broken, giving them uh, the path to liberation and emancipation. While some creatures from uh, Lisevenko's bestiary mourn their death, Others move on to the endless blank space beyond the limits of their enclosure. The final defiance of colonialism and the, the colonial release also means the reunification of spaces of freedom, the erasure of differences and the elimination of the characteristics of otherness through both territorial and personal integrity. The mystical world of, uh, world of Lisovenko reflects on pain and grief, but also the hope of the erasure of barriers and reclaiming of agency that is forthcoming. This work uh, represents the final aim of decoloniality, which as defined by the colonial scholars such as Madina Tlistanova, is an unachievable horizon of the consolidated efforts in resistance to the effects of, colon uh, of colonization, which in the case of Ukraine obtained a new dimension of resilience in the face of imminent colonizing attempts from the side of Russia, and also which is rather anachronic for the age when the global empires already have fallen. Resistance to cruel acts of the war through reclaiming the agency is also the topic of the work of Dana Kavelina's unfinished film. Uh, it's also the topic of Dana Kavelina's unfinished film, A Mother Srebrenica, Mother Donbass, 2021. And she's still working on it because uh, her, her work was interrupted by the full scale invasion, and now she, she returned to, 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 to work on, on, on this film. The artist addresses the ultimate goal of resistance both uh, to contemporary violence and the epistemic violence expressed through the formation of the history of atrocities and genocide. In this film, the violence of mass atrocity is reinterpreted through the comparative perspective on the Holocaust, particularly the Lviv pogrom of 1941, the Srebrenica massacre, and the war in the, in, in the Donbass. The artist reimagines the story of the war uh, to the one where the victims of the Holocaust are not exhumed after their violent deaths, but are resurrected by means of placing a slip of parchment in their mouths. This reference to the 17th century legend of Golem, who was resurrected after receiving a slip with a name, calls to the epistemic change to the recognition of the victims of war caused violence, their identification and finding their role in history. After witnessing the aftermath of the Russian invasion in the Kiev region and beyond, with mass graves of Ukrainian civilians discovered in the released territories and numerous more yet to discover, 
This project takes on a new magnitude for war crimes, all of which must be properly recorded, described, and eventually prosecuted. The hope for resurrection expressed by the artist is the, in the synthesis of history and mythical dimension is her anticipation of Ukraine's post-war reconstruction and regeneration, as well as the call for the effective preservation of the memory of those who suffered from the aggression. The identification of all the victims of the Russian aggression and restoration of their agency is a key task which will bring the decolonial processes further. The knowledge about the real state of human losses and the truth about war crimes will help in the formation of the epistemological basis for the disentangled history of the war. This process is seen as opposed to the suppressed traumatic history of the Soviet time from the Soviet government's concealing the crimes uh, of the Great Famine of 1932-33 in Ukraine to the suppression of memory of those killed in the Holocaust and repressed uh, during the Stalinist era. Breaking up with the post-colonial perspective in the first step is the first step in this way. And Ukrainian artists contribute to this process with their focus on both first-hand documentation of the war and its critical reflection. As the artist Mikola Ridney points out, a critical temporal distance is needed to fully evaluate the effects of the war on the Ukrainian society and culture. However, Ukrainian artists' immediate work on the creation of new disentangled epistemologies and narratives of resistance, as well as the focus on the reinstitution of previously absent subjects, is the key to the decolonization of the Ukrainian cultural sphere. This radical change when the post-colonial situation in Ukraine has been replaced by the process of decolonial release after 2022 must be reflected in tectonic shifts in research both on Ukraine and in Ukraine. And the important aspect here is the necessity of the development of new methodologies and new languages of description and analysis as part of the decolonial epistemological process which is rooted in the creation of new narratives. Both postcolonial theory and decolonial theory that I referred to throughout this presentation have their limitations in the analysis of particular Ukrainian case, as they were formed in a different context of coloniality. Uh, for example, that of Latin America or other countries of the global south and do not fully reflect on the characteristics of Ukrainian former entanglement. For example, I can mention among others, uh, uh, such characteristics the shared border with the former colonial state, the anachronic recreation of the imperial ambition and the colonizer's position by Russia in time when uh, the, the empires of the world already don't exist, and uh, Russia's current borrowing of uh, the Soviet Union's Cold War time propaganda narratives of anti-imperialist anti struggle. So Russia's mimicking of uh, also of decolonial uh, and anti-colonial, decolonial process of an anti-colonial resistance from their side, which is not, of course, present. It is essential to develop a theory beyond the postcolonial decolonial dichotomy, together with a methodology and terminology which could correctly position and discuss the Ukraine situation. So, and, and here I will finish my presentation. Thank you very much for listening. If, if you have uh, any questions, I, I would be very happy to, 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 to reply. Before I, I show the, the other part of, 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 of the talk. Thank you so much, uh, Svetlana, for a uh, wonderful uh, presentation that you presented uh, before us. Uh, and your research is excellent uh, on the, uh, as, an, as, an, uh, as, a, as art historian, as well as an artist yourself. Uh, you presented a, a good texture of the uh, decolonization and the colon, uh, colonial aspects of this war, uh, as well as the uh, art. So, uh, Coming to the question, uh, like uh, I would, I would like to request our audiences uh, to post their questions in the chat box, and we would definitely take them up. So before that, I would like to ask you something, uh, and that is related to relating to the imperial factor which you mentioned. That today the war in Ukraine under uh, Russia is is an imperial war, no doubt. It it is it has complete. Uh, context of colonialism and imperial characteristics. So as a student of history myself and having interest in comparative imperialism and colonialism, I, I, I wanted to ask you, how do you see the Russian imperialism in Ukraine and in direct comparison to the other European imperialism, such as British imperialism in Ireland or French imperialism in Algeria, 
or even the Ottoman imperialism in Middle East, obviously they are not identical, but uh, they are obviously different in nature. But, uh, uh, but in characteristics such as the distance from the imperial center or how long it lasted. And importantly, uh, as you discussed today, uh, all these had the matter of decolonization involved. So uh, uh, of 20th century. So when it comes to art and culture and also comparison, to what extent are these similar and dissimilar? How should scholars keep this in mind? So, yes. So thank you for the question. Uh, I believe that the case of Ukraine is quite unique in, in terms of uh, its colonial history because uh, uh, Ukraine has this, uh, immediate proximity to Russia. And uh, there is the presence of this border that at some times was not present because Ukraine was part of Russian empire. Uh, then it was reappearing in different places. And uh, this, um, this border uh, served as some kind of filter for uh, exchanging uh, the cultural influences between the two countries. So while we can think about, of course, Russian art, uh, appropriation of Ukrainian culture, saying that uh, Ukrainian cultural legacy of, uh, of the 20th century, in many cases, if you think about avant-garde in Ukraine, for example, was actually Russian because some, some of the artists were going to, 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 to study and work in, 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 in Russia. And this gives uh, kind of the, the foundation for their claims of appropriation. Uh, in, uh, this, this, there was uh, some kind of also uh, reciprocal move of uh, Ukrainian influence of on on, on Russian uh, on, on on Russian culture, which is of course no, nowadays is not is not recognized, and uh, is trying and Russia is trying to suppress this possibility. Um, so uh, this situation is quite unique uh, because. If you see some cl classical uh, colonial models that were done either by conquest or uh, some other processes of uh, invasion of, 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 of territories, uh, we see a significant uh, cultural differences between the colonizer and the colonized. And uh, also we see a significant geographical distance that uh, doesn't allow such easy interaction, such easy exchange and permanent exchange. And uh, this, is the this is something that should be addressed in a completely new model that would also uh, contribute to the uh, wider understanding of uh, countries of the post-Soviet space, because uh, many of them, such as Georgia, for example, found themselves in a similar situation to Ukraine. And uh, unfortunately, uh, neither uh, post-colonial theory nor decolonial theory uh, fully reflect on this. Because uh, although there is this brilliant um, uh, attempts by uh, brilliant work by Madinat Lastanova, who works with the post-Soviet space, to apply uh, the methodology from Latin America. Uh, she also, I think, accepts that it's not fully, uh, fully, 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 fully applicable and it needs further, further, further work and development within that particular methodology. And uh, of course, uh, the big problem of Ukrainian uh, colonial uh, entanglement is that uh, this problem will not uh, disappear by any kind of political resolution because precisely of this uh, proximity. The proximity will not uh, will not is not possible to resolve it by poly political means. Uh, so, but culture and working with culture in Ukraine, decolonizing the culture in Ukraine, can help uh, precisely resolving uh, these mis historical misunderstandings, these tensions, uh, this uh, ambiguities, ambivalence, and uh, postcolonial ambivalence and hybridity that uh, are results of centuries long Russian uh, colonial uh, actions in the, in the territory of Ukraine. Uh, but uh, of course, this is this work is just starting, and uh, me and my colleagues uh, who work with uh, culture and other in and other disciplines, uh, we are trying to contribute precisely to this uh, disentanglement. Coming to the decolon the question of decolonization, exactly. So, how do you see the process uh, uh, of decolonization in nineteen ninety one? Uh, when when the demise of Soviet Union took place and the 
Soviets, uh, uh, the post-Soviet space was developing, and uh, and today's decolonial or anti-imperialist resistance during the modern day world. And and importantly, I, I would like to ask one more thing: like, how did it impact the art and culture? Are there any resonances of the 1991 process in modern day uh, art? Yeah. Um, thank you for the question. And uh, I, I would distinguish between two types of uh, decolonization, but this is my uh, personal approach. One is uh, kind of slow, slow uh, decolonization when uh, it relates to the uh, post-colonial stage of uh, development of society. And uh, if we think about the situation after 1991, it was a post-colonial stage when the, this narratives uh, of the past they needed to be uh, resought, recombined, reinterpreted, uh, and uh, but there was no full break with them. So there was a long kind of durable process of uh, recombining uh, uh, those narratives, the connotations, uh, uh, the references to the past, uh, memory, uh, contested identity, and so on. And uh, in 2022, uh, the necessity of uh, active uh, anti-colonial anti resistance brought about also uh, a faster decolonization process that is also reflected in in the in the decolonial situation, which is that uh, I, 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 I well uh, is, is my position that um, uh, the history and uh, uh, the questions of history contested memory uh, are currently starting from 2022, not as important as the ongoing uh, contemporary situation and the necessity to reflect on this contemporary situation. So uh, it's like new history that is created in front of us and the necessity of uh, production of new knowledge and new narratives that would reflect on, on this situation. And this is much, uh, much uh, more rapid, much more uh, fast process of decolonization because uh, the narratives uh, related to colonial uh, to, to colonial domination of, of Russia are constantly erased and in their place new narratives are appearing. And this is also a unique process uh, that we see in Ukraine that decolonization doesn't go uh, in some kind of uh, equal pace, but it, uh, uh, it has this uh, moment that is triggered by the necessity of uh, resistance to Russia's war in Ukraine. Uh, so, uh, uh, of course, uh, if we think about 2014 uh, and uh, the work of Ukrainian artists after 2014, there was much of documentation of the war, uh, but it was more like detached documentation. It was like bringing uh, information and uh, ref artistic reflections through documentary art to the territories that were not affected uh, by, by the war. And for example, the project by Takahidze of Strawberry Andreevna uh, with drawings, with her communication with her mother who was uh, completely isolated in, uh, uh, in the Donetsk region while the artist was in Kiev, is very exemplary of this. It's like this detached doc documentation, uh, like a reportage documentation practically. Uh, and this changed in 2022 when all the territory of Ukraine was immersed in uh, uh, this full-scale invasion and artists already started creating their personal chronicles. And there is a point of uh, creating these personal chronicles was connecting with their immediate audiences who experienced the same, they experienced shelling, they experienced uh, uh, all, all these uh, negative effects of, uh, of, of Russian aggression. In, in the in the in the immediate proximity to them, and uh, this is also some particular change between post-colonial vision and the the and 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 the the, the, the decolonial uh, vision of the situation, and that's why now, for example, the artists don't turn as much to uh, historical topics. Uh, in their work as they were doing in between 2014 and 2022, because in that moment there was a necessity of creating of the archive of the war, but also a, a kind of correlating, 
comparing, making parallels of this archive also with uh, Ukraine's uh, traumatic uh, history of the past. For example, uh, turning to the history of the Soviet Donbass, as Kavelina does, or uh, speaking about uh, the topics of Holodomor, of the, of the Great Famine in Ukraine, and so on. But these references we don't see in, in the last, two, well, we almost don't see in the last two years, because uh, the new knowledge production is uh, has become uh, the main aim of Ukrainian uh, artistic practices. Uh, so uh, we have a, a question from our participant. So, oh yes, uh, Professor David Marples is here and he has the question. Uh, so uh, Professor Marples' question is, uh, has the current expansion of Russia's war had an impact on Ukraine's memory of the Great Patriotic War. This war seems to be an integral part of Putin's thinking, but Ukraine suffered more than almost any other nation during this war. And Ukraine, can Ukraine build an identity completely separate culturally and historically from Russia and common memories like the 1939 to 45 war. I'm not sure whether this question relates to decolonization. It is more about bilateral relations. So Professor Marcus wanted to ask. Uh, so, so thank you very much for the, the question. Uh, I, I'm an art historian. <laughs> so um, probably my uh, response would be kind of limited to, to my uh, to, to my field of, uh, of, of, of expertise. Uh, but uh, I think that um, well, um, uh, how to put it? I don't think that Ukraine can uh, build an identity completely separated uh, uh, from, uh, from 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 Russian influences. Of course, is 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 a, a, a utopian. It's precisely like this uh, the colonial horizon. I was I was talking about when speaking about Katerina Lysovenko's work, like a utopian dimension that the complete disentanglement from 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 colonial influences particularly in, in the case of Ukraine, uh, that Russia is, is a neighbor. Um, uh, but uh, I think that what is important in the process of decolonization and in the process of uh, uh, addressing historical topics, particularly uh, those dramatic ones and uh, uh, the historical topics, including uh, the Second World War, uh, is uh, reestablishment of uh, epistemological justice through um, establishing kind of putting correct uh, accents and correct uh, uh, focuses uh, and uh, making visible all these invisible stories and histories uh, uh, of, of the past that were uh, for decades uh, suppressed by uh, Russian uh, by, by, by Russian uh, perspective. As this kind of perspective dominant in, 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 in the region. And uh, precisely art can help uh, to such uh, interpretation of uh, the past that uh, focuses on certain moments that were misinterpreted for, for decades or were omitted for, 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 for decades. Of course, uh, erasing uh, history and erasing memory is not the point here. Rather, is uh, uh, Return, is returning of uh, visibility to certain moments that were uh, undervalued or uh, omitted or that they were uh, precisely those absent subjects also that uh, I, I, I was talking about in my, in my presentation, that the subjects uh, of knowledge that are uh, deemed incapable of uh, some kind of knowledge production because, because of their uh, oppressed situation. So uh, the, uh, the task, of uh, Ukrainian culture in general is uh, to reestablish uh, the epistemological justice and bring visibility to those elements that were not were not present. Thank you, Sipnana. And also thank you to Professor Marcus for this excellent uh, question. Uh, we can definitely have a, a good discussion on this, particularly on this topic someday. And uh, thank you so much for taking this up. So uh, lastly, we can uh, we will definitely move on to the last phase of this event where you can sh uh, uh, show us some of your uh, own portfolio. But before that, I, I just lastly wanted to uh, 
ask uh, ask this question because our CGC has a vertex on genocide, Holocaust, and disaster studies, which we uh, we particularly focus on the research of research on at atrocities, war crimes, and genocides. In your in your uh, lecture, we also came across the atrocities and the genocide part. So, uh, so I just wanted to know, like, how do you observe the question of genocide, specifically the cultural genocide, uh, in this war since two thousand fourteen to twenty two, and even in the present day? If you could comment uh, briefly on this, yeah. Uh, what, what what do you mean by cultural genocide? So the uh, the dominance over the uh, over the Ukrainian culture by the uh, Russian uh, uh, Russian government and yes. Uh, so, so thank you for, for, for the question. I would say that uh, uh, the one of the aims of uh, Russia's uh, current war of aggression is not only um, a physical destruction of uh, of Ukraine's uh, army and Ukraine's civilians. But also, uh, it targets uh, the cultural legacy of Ukraine, and uh, there have been numerous examples of this. When uh, uh, different uh, museums, uh, cultural centers, uh, uh, the different places of major importance for, for Ukraine's uh, memory uh, were ruined by Russia sections, and uh, it looks like that. Uh, Many uh, cases uh, were quite, quite intentional. Like we can uh, think about um, um, in, in Kharkiv region, uh, last year there was uh, uh, a, a shelling, a direct shelling of uh, the museum, uh, the, the, the house museum of uh, great Ukrainian philosopher Grigory Skalarada, which de we destroyed the, his mansion and uh, completely and his personal belongings that were exhibited there and there was no uh, point otherwise uh, of shelling that place because it was in some kind of isolated area in a small, small village so uh, we, uh, we we can see that there is this targeted aiming at uh, erasure of uh, ukrainian cultural legacy and ukrainian as well as ukrainian contemporary culture because uh, many many artists they have, have, have suffered also from from Russian aggression uh, in, in the occupied territories, and uh, this just shows the importance of uh, decolonization and the importance of resistance uh, through disentangling of uh, of these cultural narratives because uh, it shows uh, that uh, culture is not uh, some kind of side. Uh, effect of uh, of uh, so, so, so social relations uh, and uh, it is uh, directly uh, the, something bringing this epistemological uh, basis uh, to the society and this epistemological basis is precisely what forms uh, the structure of, of, of the society and forms uh, all these processes inside of it so and uh, yes so uh, cultural resistance to Russian aggression is one of uh, the most important uh, focuses uh, at this moment. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Sublana. Like, uh, and uh, so we do not have any questions, uh, any more questions uh, here. So I think we can uh, proceed to the final uh, part of this uh, event. Uh, yes. Okay, yeah, I will, I will show some of, some of my works. Uh, I will not analyze them uh, as uh, much as uh, I analyze uh, other artists' works uh, in my capacity of art historian, because I, I feel that uh, if, if I'm in the capacity of the artist, it's kind of it's better to, to leave some, maybe some, some, some questions open. And uh, I have a presentation here with some selected projects. Uh, mostly focusing on the project of the morphology of war. Uh, this was the project that I developed in 2016-2017. Uh, this is a project of uh, graphic uh, murals, digital graphic murals. Uh, and uh, 
the main uh, idea behind this uh, project was that uh, every society and in times of uh, crisis, in times of uh, conflict, uh, produces its own monsters. And uh, war actually contributes to this, um, to this process of uh, uh, production and replication of, of these monsters. And I spoke about how uh, uh, destructive instincts are uh, rooted into uh, visual culture throughout history. And that's why I, I took uh, some, some of the images from uh, medieval uh, manuscripts and bestiaries and others uh, from uh, from other other sources uh, rich in the like 18th century uh, manuscripts and uh, uh, kind of a, a diversity but uh, of, of, of these historical references and um, uh, I wanted also to speak in this project of uh, how uh, mediation and uh, how propaganda influences the, the creation of uh, these monsters or these grotesque uh, creatures and uh, the dissemination of, of them. So, and uh, I, that's why I did these uh, murals uh, that are also uh, um, a reference to uh, dance macabre, the, the dance of the death, where these monsters and all this, uh, um, in all, 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 all their grotesque appearance, uh, they go towards uh, their own uh, the downfall, uh, being led by, 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 by the death. And uh, this is another project, uh, which is the project uh, that I started actually in 2014 uh, as collages. Uh, it was called then Aftermath. Uh, and uh, here I uh, also addressed this. Um, topic of uh, 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 ambivalence, uh, where the images uh, uh, present themselves as uh, rather, um, uh, if you return to the, to the painting, it would, be, it would be easier for me to, 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 to describe it, but uh, where the images uh, uh, conceal uh, the, the conceal fear, conceal uh, some kind of threat and uh, all these topics uh, brought about by the war, uh, and it, they conceal it behind some attractive appearances. And uh, I tried to work in that project in, in this uh, fine balance between this embellishment of the reality and uh, the, this dark side of, 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 of this reality brought about by the war. And already in 2021, 2022, uh, when uh, it was this expectation of uh, the full scale invasion very present, uh, I developed this project to a painting project and I expanded it also with, with, with other topics. Uh, so um, this uh, work uh, of uh, the morphology of war, uh, I, I, I find it quite um, quite quite useful to uh, speak uh, not only about the logic of war in general, how it uh, fosters uh, this um, um, a vision uh, of uh, both sides uh, as the monsters. Uh, but in application to the current situation, uh, I would say that also uh, it uh, speaks about uh, precisely the dissolution of post-colonial ambivalence and hybridity and uh, kind of more uh, sharp uh, vision, uh, more clear vision of uh, who uh, the monsters in this situation are with all this outbreak of full-scale full -scale aggression. So uh, this, in this project, and I wrote a text, which is available on my website, and uh, this was for, for, for recent exhibition in Tallinn, where I precisely speak how, how the focus of uh, this shifted from this uh, vision that uh, the situation is ambiguous to uh, quite uh, an unambiguous uh, uh, vision of uh, aggressor as, as uh, from, from this point of view of uh, his, his monstrosity. And this change that he experiences, which is uh, practically also an epistemological change, because uh, uh, in, this, uh, in this situation, the Russian society appears as a uh, subject, uh, both, both uh, uh, subject and object of its own uh, epistemological violence. Uh, and uh, th th this is basically more or less my, um, 
yeah, so some projects that I wanted to show today. If you have any questions, I'm very happy to, to, to respond. Well, thank you so much, Ritlana. Like, uh, you are a prolific artist, and uh, it, it's um, uh, the paintings. Obviously, I'm not a scholar of uh, uh, art or an art historian, but they're ex excellent. And uh, the work which you presented today are uh, fabulous. Mm -hmm. I hope everyone enjoyed. And yes, so uh, you are also writing a book recently, which is coming out this year. Is it on uh, decolonial theory as well? Uh, I'm currently working on two books. Uh, one is uh, a monograph, uh, <laughs> which is uh, called uh, On the Coloniality and War, uh, the Ukrainian-Russian case. And uh, this is precisely my uh, attempt to uh, contribute to this necessity of development of methodology and terminology for particular uh, particular uh, case of uh, colonial entanglement between Russia and Ukraine. And uh, this book uh, will include some um, uh, focus, uh, 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 a theoretical part, but also some case studies uh, of Ukrainian contemporary art, but not limited to it. Also, I will, I will talk, kind of in the context, I will talk about literature, for example, kind of Ukrainian culture as, uh, and, uh, uh, and institutional uh, transformation in Ukrainian culture also is, is an important topic. And for example, my, my research stay at uh, the Canon Institute helped me enormously to, to develop that perspective. How actually the structure of Ukrainian cultural institution transformed since 2014, and how this change was further fostered in 2022, and how precisely this structure and exchange between these institutions uh, uh, contribute to the decolonization in Ukraine. Uh, and another book I'm working on is uh, the edited volume, which is called uh, Art in Ukraine Identity Construction and Anti Colonial Resistance. And this is uh, a collection of texts by uh, Ukrainian curators, art historians, uh, scholars of uh, cultural history, anthropology, uh, artists, uh, uh, who uh, will focus on different aspects of uh, development of Ukrainian art after 2004, starting with the uh, Orange Revolution, uh, which was one of important shifts in, uh, in, 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 in these questions of identity and uh, some understanding that there is some kind of change in this post-colonial situation to, towards uh, kind of deeper understanding of necessity of reconsiderations and recombinations in, uh, in this post-colonial situation and uh, up to uh, the current uh, war of, uh, of, of aggression and uh, artistic responses to it. So this is, these are my two projects. Uh, for both, I have already contracts with a major uh, publishing uh, houses and uh, hopefully, well, <laughs> um, I think yes, uh, but uh, always there is this uh, kind of uh, moment of, uh, you know, that like something can be delayed or something, but hopefully every, if uh, everything goes on time, then uh, in the beginning of 2024, both books should be already published. Excellent. And it sounds really interesting, like, so, uh... Uh, thank you so much, Svetlana. We are almost at the end of our session. So thank you so much for the uh, wonderful presentation and uh, presenting us your stimulating research on this was uh, really an unique theme for us today. The art, Ukrainian wartime art. We have already done events on this war and we have been covering various aspects of this war from the perspective of intellectual history, philosophy, uh, and all genocide and international affairs, but this was something uh, really new for us because this was uh, uh, this is uh, related to art and culture and and uh, we had a really fabulous scholar today who presented a great uh, like, uh, uh, research. So it was really uh, it means a lot. Thank you so much, Svetlana, for joining us today. So thank you very much for inviting me. It was a pleasure really to talk. Yes, thank you. <laughs>